right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to uh, the superintendent remarks. It's part of Sabbath school here. And um, you know, I'm glad that you guys are here on this beautiful Sabbath morning. And I want to welcome you guys who are online as well. Glad you can be uh, you can be joining us today. But let us pr <clears throat> excuse me. Let us pray and let us um, get started. Okay. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for everyone who is here and um, is enjoying the Sabbath. And I pray that um, you know we can receive a blessing from studying your word. And I pray that um, we leave your change. So I invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us, and um, not just for this talk, but also throughout Sab School and especially for the, the, the service. Thanks again for all that you've done for us, and keep preparing us for heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. Has anyone passed out before? I know I have. Okay, se several people. <laughs> so, um, I, I've, I've, you know, it, it's funny, like, I'm very familiar with that feeling now, but the first time it happened, I was freaking out because I've never felt it before. I didn't know what was happening, right? And the funny, you know, the. After it happened a few times, I kind of got used. I knew what to expect, and I welcomed it in a way. And, and, and I'll explain more of that later. But you know, the first time it happened, I was drawing blood, and I know Tom's here, and he does not like blood stories. So I'm going to try to be more descriptive, so he'll pass out, and we can get a live demonstration. All right? I'm kidding. But um, <laughs> um, no. But like the first time it happened, I was drawing blood, and. Um, and I, I wasn't watching it, you know, come out of my arm or anything like that. But I, it just, I just felt really weird. And I remember I started feeling really lightheaded. I started seeing stars, kind of like, you know, what you see in a cartoon around the head kind of thing. <laughs> and I started freaking out, which made me start feeling worse because I had no idea what's going on. And I remember asking the person who, who was there, um, what's going on with me? <laughs> and and I don't remember what she said, but the next thing I remember was sh sh uh, her going, Shane, Shane, stay with me. <laughs> and then I woke up, and I'm in a stretcher being escorted down to the, uh, to the ED. And the person who was pushing the stretcher goes, um, Shane, I think you were seizing. Um, do you remember any of it? I'm like, no, I don't remember. And that's a sign of a seizure. You know, you don't remember it happening. But the thing is, after they ran tests and everything, they, they'd ruled out a seizure. I didn't have a seizure, I just twitched. And they said I had a vasovagal syncope and twitching is normal. And you know, uh, the next time it happened, I was at work and I was recovering from a cold and I was really sick. I was not drinking water, I just stopped. I, and I told my boss that you know, I wasn't feeling well. And I, and, I, and I laid over on my desk and I put my head down and then the next thing I remember was my boss going, Shane, are you OK? And he pulls me up and puts me upright in my chair, which he shouldn't have done that, because I started to feel better when I put my head down on my desk. But he pulls me up and goes, Shane, are you OK? And as he did that, I started twitching again. You know, face, face and neck twitching and stuff like that. He thought I was easing. He calls a rapid response. This is when I worked at Kettering. And, and I was awake enough at a time to go, no, what are you doing? <laughs> so there's another ED bill. <laughs> but the thing is, both times, in the middle of it, I started feeling like I was going to sleep. And I love that part of it, because all of the stress and everything that was going on, here comes the sleep. And I welcomed it. I was like, all right, here we go, time to go to sleep. It, it's, it's a good feeling, especially when you're, when you're feeling all of that stuff, right? But the thing is, is that, after the fact, looking back at it, my thoughts wasn't, it, it, it wasn't like, oh no, am I dying? Like, it wasn't, what about my family? What's gonna happen there? What, what about my family? What about my standing with God? You know? I was just so focused on entering into that rest. Like, I, I would just, you know, and the thing is, like, it's me saying that now, it, it sounds really selfish, right? I wasn't thinking about anybody else, I was thinking about me. But, the thing is, is that I kind of reason this in two different ways, I guess. The, the first reason being, you know, I, I was just so confident, I guess, with my relationship with God that I didn't have to worry about it, right? That, that was one thing. Another thing that I thought of was, 
my standing with God wasn't even a thought in my mind. I, I was, uh, you know, it, like it was, you know, the fr uh, the phrase of out of sight, out of mind. It was kind of like a second thought. I wasn't even thinking about it, and I can't say which one. And I'm glad I didn't, you know, passed away that day because, like, I feel like my my my, my walk with God, my relationship with God, has been a whole lot better, um, to, you know, today in recent times than it was back then. But the thing is, is that like. You know, should should I have felt that way? I, I don't know, but it reminds me of this verse here. Let's go to um, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes seven. Ecclesiastes seven, one and two. Okay, it says there, a good name is better than precious ointment. The day of death better than the day of one's birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. So I remember reading this years and years ago, and I was amazed, and I was just thinking about it. The day of our death is better than the day of our birth. What does that even mean? That's just, that's just really weird. To, and it's even found in the Bible, right? And at the time, I was talking to Pastor Zagara. I mean, you guys remember him, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I was talking to him about it, and, um, and he pointed me to Revelation 14, 13. Let's go there real quick. Revelation 14, 13. It says there, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord for, um, from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So why is the day of death better? Because, you know, because they're, uh, we're, we're resting in the Lord, but of course their works follow them. And, you know, the righteous are written, it's written in the books of heaven that they are saved, and now nothing can change that. And that is a blessing, right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we're saved by works or anything like that, but when Christ is in us, it's showed by our character and our actions. Christ changes us, and now, it's, and, and now we are more like him, right? And the thing is, this reminds me very much of the Waldensians. Are you guys familiar with who the Waldensians are? Yeah, and this is really cool. Um, the French word for uh, Waldensians is vaudois, right? And this literally means valley people <laughs> because that's where they lived. They lived in the valleys and in the mountains, all these like nooks and crannies and stuff like that. But the thing is they were so committed to the Bible during the time, especially at the time of the Reformation and, and, and that time that, that Rome would try to hunt them and kill them you know, and God protected them in their mountains and in their valley homes. And, you know, they went through this, uh, this, this training that, that when, they were, when they were done with it, everyone knew that they were, they were ready to be a missionary, right? So listen to this quote from, um, it's from the book, well, I found the, the quote from the book, The History of the Waldensians, but the original quote is from La no Nobel uh, Lacon, uh, which it, it talks about the history of the Waldensians, right? And this is the code that they live by, and, and it talks about, you know, uh, they even kept the Sabbath too, but listen to this quote. It goes, whoever is a good man and wishes to love God and fear Jesus Christ, who will neither speak ill of his neighbor, nor swear, nor lie, who will neither commit adultery, nor kill, nor steal, nor avenge himself um, uh, of his enemy, of him, they say, they are, uh, he is a vaudois and worthy of death. He's worthy of death. I love that quote. You know, I wish that, can that be said about you? I wish it could be said about me, honestly. <laughs> no, you know, think about it. You know, it's, it goes back to what it said in Revelation, right? Um, look at the disciples, look at the reformers, look at how some of them, some of them died. The sky opened up and they were able to see heaven. They, some of them died singing. That's amazing. You know, 
on a personal level, when we see Jesus on the cross and he, and he asks us to give, us, give up our sin, is it worth it? Yes, right? In the Bible, when it says, in Timothy, when it says that he who lives a godly life will suffer persecution, is it worth it? Yes, right? When, um, and in the time, like what uh, Pastor Michael was talking about, like in the time when, when like in the future, when our lives are even being threatened because we would rather follow God than man, will it be worth it then? Yes, you know? In, in a sense, they're doing us a favor. <laughs> that, that's what's so amazing about it. They're doing us a favor. And the thing is, you know, we have to start that now. We, we, we have to cu- culture that relationship with God now. That, you know, make the small decisions now that we're standing for God. And then by the time we get there, it's not even, it's not even a second thought. Like, like, like a relationship with God is not the second thought. That is the main thought. <laughs> anyway, let us, um, let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, the testimonies of these people who have come to pass. And, and I want you to prepare me, and I want you to prepare all of these people here as well to be worthy of death. Thank you again for all that you've done for us. Help us do your will, and definitely keep preparing us for heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, so um, the different uh, Sabbath school classes, there's one here in the sanctuary. There's a sanctuary class. There's the founder's class, which is found behind the glass right over here. There's a Berean class, which is found in Pastor Bill's office. And then there's the, the... Tim's class um, up the stairs to the left here, and there's the young adults class, which is in the, in the fellowship hall to the right, and then there's another adult Sabbath school class in, this, uh, in the fellowship hall to the left. You guys have a great Sabbath. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's a sunny day today, isn't it? Um, It's been a fabulous week. You know, um, the weather forecast all weekend, this last weekend, from Monday, was supposed to be a cloudy day. And on Monday morning, I woke up. Oh, I prayed. I prayed, Lord, please, we want to see the eclipse. And sun, I asked for sun just for that period of time. Woke up Monday morning and there was sun and there was sun all day. It rained the rest of the, rest of the week except today the sun came out. God is absolutely amazing. So Rhonda, welcome back to Centerville. And um, you know this is the greatest church on earth, of course. If you don't know, I'll have to tell you, instruct you later. And we're glad to have a friend of ours, Michael Duncan, with us today. Welcome, Michael to our church at Centerville. I know that you'll agree with me once today is finished, that this is the best church in the union and probably the division. <laughs> All right. Um, Thanksgiving's request for prayer. Um, what's been going on? Anything I'm missing? Yes, Stephanie.
Okay. So yeah. it's very serious, and um, I know this will affect Todd and Nuff, of course. But please pray for him and okay. his family. Okay. And Allie is through her surgery and home, but she is still experiencing a lot of pain. And the pain from her foot that she had before is a different pain, and uh, she's thankful for that. She also had some work done on a flap on her hand. So please pray for recovery yeah. for Allie. Kay. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else have anything? Yes, go ahead. I would like to pray for my sister, Tempe Raglan. Tammy? Tempe Raglan. Tempe Raglan. Yes, she's recovering from a stroke. Okay. All right. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. And we're thankful for Julia's 85th birthday. Okay, yes. 85th? Yes. You look great. It's her daughter. Yes, okay. All right, well, um, let's go ahead and uh, we will start with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this glorious sunny Sabbath that you've given us. We're grateful that, that you are a God who loves us unconditionally, who looks after us, who provides for our needs. You're a God that answers our prayers. And so, Lord, this morning we come to you with uh, concerns that we've shared together. Um, Todd, uh, on top of his own health problems, his father now is in hospice. And so I just pray that you be close to him. And um, may he know that you love him, that you are with him, you will walk with him, um, that he has nothing to be afraid of because you are a good God always. And then we pray for Ali, who has been through so much, but she has recovered now from, or had this last surgery, and we ask that you continue to be with her recovery, that it be um, complete, and that she's able to have whatever prosthesis she needs to be able to function again. And then, Lord, um, we are grateful that Julia has had an 85th birthday. Um, her daughter, however, has had a stroke, and so we ask that you be with her and with all the, the therapists and physicians who are working with her, that they'll have wisdom and that she'll also make a full recovery from this stroke. Lord, we are grateful that you've provided your word to us, that we can understand your purposes. As a matter of fact, we can understand where you are taking us and that we have faith in where you are taking us. And as we study today in particular, what a wonderful lesson you've provided for us. We ask for your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit will open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word, for Jesus' sake, amen. amen. All right, we have a fantastic lesson today. And um, the, the title of the lesson, I want you to be opening your Bible, not to the text you think. It's a little bit different, but the title of the lesson is The Central Issue love or selfishness. Now, um, to get at that uh, lesson, actually, I'm not going to read the memory text right now, but we'll get to it. What I wanted to do is to ask you a question, and it comes from Monday's lesson, and interestingly, the memory text is also from, um, from Monday's lesson. But let me just have you consider a couple of texts that are referenced on Monday, and then we'll look at the questions that Mark Finley has given us to contemplate, and then we'll read our memory text. So first of all, just in Hebrews, I, you don't really even have to go there, I will, but the questions, let me just read this, Hebrews chapter t um, 11, um, verses 35 to 38, describe um, some scary stuff. And the scary stuff is uh, that um, some people might be tortured who wants to be tortured? I don't. Um, and um, that some will have trial of mockings and scourgings and imprisonment and being stoned, sawn in two, and so forth. 
describes all those things. And then um, in Psalm 46, verse 1, which is one of the texts on Monday's lesson, Psalm 46, verse 1, it tells us, and just consider our prayer request that we just had. Oh, this uh, Psalm chapter 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So the question that um, Pastor Mark wants us to think about is over on Monday's lesson, if you have your quarterly with, with you, and it says this. Um, how do these passages harmonize with the idea of God's protection and is there a contradiction in the idea of God's protection and God allowing some to face painful suffering, even a martyr's death for the cause of Christ? Then the last question on that page in the pink section says, what should it mean to us that the Bible writers who certainly knew pain and suffering could nevertheless again and again write about the reality of God's love? So the question is, is there a disconnect between suffering and persecution and so forth and the love of God? Is there a disconnect between that? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Yes, Joe. When I think about God's protection over me, I think about his ability to keep me in his covenant and his salvation. Okay. Not necessarily physically well, <coughs> but my salvation is sure through Christ, and that protection is guaranteed. Yes, okay. Very good, I like that. So God has guaranteed us the protection of his salvation, the gift of life. And that's the gift he's given us. It's very important for us to understand what God has promised us and what he has not promised us. Anybody else want to respond to that? Yes, go ahead. Yes. And yes. the devil is the enemy yes. that wants us to think those thoughts yes. of our loving God. Yes. And he has been working tirelessly to convince us that God is the one that is responsible for all these atrocities that we see in our world. Yes. Yes. So I like that. So God, my God is the same God. Okay, thank you very much. So God is not the author of death and suffering and so forth. In fact, Jesus Christ himself, when he was on earth, walking through a field, um, he said, an enemy has done this. And we have to understand, as Seventh-day Adventists, we appreciate the fact that we are living in the great controversy. This is the great controversy going on. And so, um, so we have to appreciate that. Did you have your hand up, Michael? I was just going to say, everything in this world is temporary. One. Yes. And secondly, God has endured <clears throat> suffering. All right, so God has, in, in Jesus Christ has engraved, and God himself too, you'll see when we read some stuff today, um, that God has endured intense suffering, more than we can imagine. So let me read the memory text then. It's in that context that this memory text was given, and it is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It's in the quarterly, if you, or just you go to your Bible, if you have your quarterly, you can read that. But it says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So it's not that God has ever said, life's gonna be nice. Everything you ask for, just ask me, it'll be given to you. That's a misreading of the text. The Bible says that God will be with us in our trouble. Yes, Dr. Small. The devil isn't going to waste his time on people who are already his. The, those who are persecuted are ones that are that the devil thinks he might be able to, to destroy, yes. and yet God's promise is solid. Yes, yes, okay, very good. Okay, now, so that was for Monday, because that's where the memory text came from, but I wanna look at something I'm telling you that I've studied before, but has just moved my heart in a very special way this week as I prepared for the Sabbath school lesson. I want us to turn to Luke 
chapter 19, um, and that's, this, this is from, uh, from Sunday, but Luke chapter 19, and I just want to read verses 41 to 44. Before I do that, I want you to get into the scene. So this is the scene of the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. This is happening actually, as we, as we look at this passage, the, the, the introduction to it is that Jesus Christ is on his way to Jerusalem. This is Sunday, the triumphal entry is Sunday of Passover week of AD 31. And so Jesus Christ, there's this triumphal entry, let me just read a little bit here. So it says in Luke chapter 19, Jesus instructed his disciples to go get a donkey, um, loose him, and, um, and uh, he will ride it. So they found the donkey, colt, and uh, they loosed it, they brought it to Jesus, they threw their own garments on this colt, and they put Jesus on the donkey. And uh, as they went, they spread their own clothes on the road. I mean, this is a scene of celebration. So their clothes are on the road. Um, then as he was drawing, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. Now, let me give you a little bit of a, a little bit of geography lesson there. So where they had come from, they were going up to, they had to go up to uh, the Mount of Olives, which is 300 feet above the temple and Jerusalem. So they can come up this hill and they're looking down um, and to, they can see the temple. So, so um, they, uh, they were drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives and the whole multitude of the disciples. Now remember how Jesus had a lot of followers called disciples, but the 12 were set aside. They began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So, as you think about this scene, what do you see? So far. Yes, Stephanie. Jesus being glorified. Okay. And so there's a sense of excitement and anticipation and this is amazing, because kings rode on, those, on colts like that. So everybody's excited. They're singing, they're praising God in the streets. It's a scene of incredible celebration. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. You feel like it's the 4th of July with the fireworks. That's about what I could describe it like. All right, so now I'm gonna read the text that we're supposed to read for the day. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children with you, within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Okay. As, you, as I read through this passage there in Luke 20, verse 41 to 44, what things about this passage are important as you read them? As we've just read it. What things are important in this passage or grab your attention in the passage? Okay, okay, all right, I like that. Thank you, Nancy. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead, Daniela. Okay, they did not know the time of their visitation. Okay, very good, thank you. Anybody else? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. So he was giving them a heads up about what was to occur. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Anybody else that noticed anything in this passage that really stuck out to you? So as we read the passage leading up to it, we see an incredible celebration. And in fact, they think that the king is coming. That's what they see, right? Um, now, I just want to read to you um, two passages, one from the Desire of Ages and the other from the Great Controversy. Also remember, as we read these passages from these two, that um, verse 43 and 44 describe to us what is about to happen, that there would be enemies, they will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side. Okay, so this is from um, Desire of Ages, page 575. And Ellen White says this, Jesus gazes upon the scene and the vast multitude hush their shouts, spellbound by the sudden vision of beauty. All eyes turn upon the Savior, expecting to see in his countenance the admiration they themselves feel. But instead of this, they behold a cloud of sorrow. They are surprised and disappointed to see his eyes fill with tears. And his body rock to and fro like a tree before the tempest. While a wail of anguish a wail of anguish burst from his quivering lips as if from the depths of a broken heart. And that's where the title of Sunday's lesson comes from. It comes from the depths of a broken heart. What a sight was this for angels to behold. Their loved commander in an agony of tears. Jesus had wept at the grave of Lazarus, but was, it was in godlike grief in sympathy with human woe. But this was sudden sorrow, was like a note of wailing in a grand triumphal chorus. In the midst of the scene of rejoicing, where all were paying him homage, Israel's king was in tears. Tears and grows of insuppressible agony. The multitude was struck with a sudden gloom. Their acclamations were silenced. Then she says, many wept in sympathy with a grief they could not comprehend. Have you guys ever started crying when someone else is crying? You don't even know why they're crying yet, but you start to cry? I hate that when it happens to me because it happens too often. The men, some men I know for sure understand that. Other men don't understand that. When he, and then now the great controversy version says, um, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. That's from Luke 19, verse 41. The world's redeemer was overwhelmed with a sudden mysterious sorrow. He, the son of God, the promised one of Israel, whose power had conquered death and called it, its captives from the grave, was in tears. Not of ordinary grief, but of an intense, intense, irrepressible agony. Why was Jesus crying? Why was he weeping? And it's kind of funny, I, I love how Ellen White, Ellen White wrote this because when you read the Bible, it said that as he approached the crest of, approached the, crest of the hill of Mount, of, of Mount of Olives, he began to weep. And we read over it and keep on going. We only recognize that Jesus Christ, she says he was in agony, his body was rocking to and fro. It was irrepressible, the amount of tears that he went through. Why was he crying? Why was he weeping? Yes, Joe. I believe it's because we can see into the future. Yeah. Uh, we can see that this, his people, that he had come to save, were going to completely reject him. And he'll definitely in turn that beautiful structure being destroyed at some point. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, Joe. Yes. Um, when, when they're all excited and they're praising him and stuff and they're referring to him as their king, they'd wanted to make him king before. 
before, and I think that they think finally he's going to take his position and he'll drive the Romans out and give us peace. And he's saying, that's not what really gives you peace. Yes. And you've missed it, and now it's hidden. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't see it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. What was necessary for that peace was the acceptance of him, the Messiah. But they missed it. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on that? Um, did I hear my name? Um, I think that if you read Matthew, this was the second text, Matthew chapter 23. And by the way, I just want to make mention of one thing. Jesus Christ was on his way to the cross. He was on his way to Jerusalem. Interestingly, how many of you have been to Israel and the Mount of Olives? Several people have been there. Okay. If you, if you come out of the temple area in Jerusalem, walk across, walk through the Sheep Gate, across the Kitchen Valley, and hike up the Mount of Olives, and it's a pretty stiff hike in a hot day, um, and you're sitting on top there, you can see down and see Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, what's interesting, so Jesus Christ was seeing Jerusalem, he was seeing the temple, he was seeing Calvary, and from there you could see the Sheep Gate. What was the importance of the Sheep Gate? Does anybody remember the importance of the Sheep Gate? Jesus Christ, remember, was not, um, he was not sacrificed in Jerusalem. He was sacrificed outside the gate. Outside, and he was going to be walking through the Sheep Gate to get to the cross. He was going to be crucified outside the city, outside the gate. So as he's sitting up there, he's looking down. He, his history goes before him. But this is not why he was weeping. He was not weeping because he was about to go to the cross. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse, verse 37, it says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. I'm going to read what Ellen White said about this as quickly as I can. She says, what then, if it wasn't that he was going to the cross and he could see all his suffering come up before him, Ellen White says, what then was the grief of him whose prophetic glance took in not years but ages? He beheld the destroying angel with sword uplifted against the city which had so long been Jehovah's dwelling place. From the ridge of Olivet, the very spot afterward occupied by Titus and his army, he looked across the valley upon the sacred courts and porticos, and with tear-dimmed eyes, he saw in awful perspective the walls surrounded by aliens. He heard the voice of mothers and children crying for bread in the besieged city. Can you imagine that? He saw what was about to happen, and in his mind came the mothers and the children that would be suffering because of the rejection of Jesus Christ. It brought him to tears of irrepressible agony. Absolutely amazing. And then she says, she quotes Matthew uh, 24, what we just read. She, say, uh, she says this, looking down the ages, he saw that, and that's, the age, that's us, okay? I'm talking about us. Looking down the ages, he saw the covenant people scattered in every land, like wrecks on a desert shore. In the temporal retribution about to fall upon her children, he saw but the first draft from that cup of wrath, which at the final judgment she, she, she must drain to its dregs. Divine pity, yearning love, found utterance in the mournful words, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a chick under her wings. Then she says, Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief and rebellion. The woes of a fallen race pressing upon his soul forced from his lips that exceeding bitter cry. He saw the record of sin traced in human misery, tears and blood. His heart was moved with infinite pity for the afflicted and suffering ones of earth. He yearned to relieve them all. Then she says, he was willing to pour out his soul unto death to bring salvation within their reach. 
but few would come to him that they might have, have life, the majesty of heaven in tears. That's how she ends it. What, as we read these verses here in Luke and Matthew, they really are for us. They're not just for those people, they're for us. Jesus Christ today is still in tears over the multitudes who won't accept him. I know some of you have family members. I have family members who don't accept, believe in Jesus Christ. If I can get the picture in my head of Jesus Christ weeping, irrepressible agony, tears of incredible pain for my family members, it gives me courage that I'm not the only one who's concerned. It's absolutely amazing. All right. So then now, why was Jerusalem destroyed? So Jerusalem got destroyed. Why was Jerusalem ultimately destroyed? The rejection of Jesus Christ as Messiah. It's interesting this. If you look at the principles of temples being destroyed through history with Babylon, in Babylon, um, the, the Babylonian captivity and so forth, Messiah was rejected and the city is destroyed. That's just the pattern as you look through history. That's what, that's what happened. So um, and I think that's one of the major issues. So as, as we look at this particular thing, um, the fact of the matter is the first temple was destroyed in 586 BC um, and uh, ho hoping that there would be na national renewal and spiritual growth as a result of what happened there. And then um, in 8031, the rulers and so forth made a decision that they would rather have whatever than Jesus Christ and they crucified him. When they had sealed the deal, God still bore long and didn't destroy the temple for another 30 something years in 70 AD when it was destroyed. God bears long with us. It's absolutely amazing. Um, and then grace was poured out for them. They didn't accept it. When the Messiah is rejected, then this would happen. But Ellen White says something really important that I wanted. Uh, actually, when I read it, I was a little surprised. It's in the Great Controversy. By the way, the quarterly gives us chapters to read in the Great Controversy for every lesson, which have been a blessing to me. It's just really absolutely fantastic. But she says this. The horrible cruelties enacted in the destruction of Jerusalem are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. Again, we talked about this at the beginning. When you have suffering, who's responsible for suffering? It's not God. Jesus said an enemy has done this. So that's really important. And then, so she says, these things are a demonstration of Satan's vindictive power over those who yield to his control. And that's in Great Controversy, page 35. On page 36, she says, God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgression. That's comforting to know that. But he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul, no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. He gets the blame. God does not get the blame. Satan gets the blame. But he cannot protect us when we persist, and she used these words, persistently reject him. He doesn't say, oh, you don't like me? Boom, you're gone. You have to persistently, continuously reject him. And he finally has to give you up and give you over. Yes, go ahead. Thought came to mind and yes. I can't resist it. Yes. When the Jews looked at that temple, they gloried in that building. Yes. The building, the majesty and splendor of that building. And to me, it was blocking their view from the person that they went to worship yeah. in that building. Yes. And it became an idol. Yes. In my mind. Yes. It had to be removed. Yes. 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 We must be careful that we shouldn't put anything as of anything as a God before Jesus. Yes. God sends angels. Yes. The first point I want to 
to leave us with. We have, to have three points. We've got three points. First point is God has a hard time letting us go. As I read through these quotes this week, over and over I read the quotes and I just kept realizing that being God has a hard time letting us go. It's amazing. So Karl Barth, he was a, uh, what was he? He was a, a second century um, apolo apologist. Excuse me, he wasn't either. He was a 20th century Swiss German theologian. And Karl Barth, <laughs> And this is, a, this is true, true story. He was lecturing at um, Rockefeller Chapel at the University of Chicago in April of 1962. I know some of you have heard the story. I'm sure, Angel, you've probably heard the story. You've heard the story. And I researched it, and it, they're, they're eyewitnesses that was, that was true. So a medical student, it was a Q&A time, and a medical, I mean, excuse me, a student, uh, one of the attendees, a student, asked him a question. And he said, Dr. Bath, can you please summarize your theology in one sentence? And Karl Barth, that incredibly brilliant, famous theologian said, I will tell you what I learned at my mother's knees. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. I think it's an incredible thing for us to understand that God has a very hard time letting us go, because he loves us with a love that cannot be bound. It's absolutely amazing. All right, any other comment before we go to our next section? Um, any other comment for the next section? What am I looking at? All right, um, let me ask you a question. What is Satan's greatest weapon against us? Is it persecution? Persecution? It's, it's one. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Ron. Deception. It's what? Deception. Oh, deception. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that the devil is cunning. Lucifer said it's cunning, subtle. We can be deceived. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Overconfidence. Overconfidence. Okay, I like that. Overconfidence. Deception. Okay. What I want to go through is, is the, the lesson has um, faithful amid persecution. And the question is, you know, what's the, what's the biggest thing? What's Satan's, what's he going to pull out against us in these days? Will we, now, some of us will indeed, you know, faint at the thought of persecution. Someone told me something this morning. It was right outside the church door here, outside the sanctuary. It was all I could do not to scream. She told me of a small baby, a child, I guess it's going to make national news, that was almost eaten to death by rats. I hate rats. And every time I think about the time of trouble, I think of myself being in a damp cell with rats all around me, and I pray, God, I do not want to deny you at all. Please don't send rats. That's what I say. Persecution by rats. Um, the Lord knows me well. He just put me to, he, he put me to sleep. We'll have to endure the rats. <laughs> Let's look at a couple of, of passages here that were given to us. One, and they're all in Acts. Very quickly, I just want to look at what persecution does to the Christian. What does persecution do to the Christian? So if you look at Acts chapter 8, we see there how in verse 1 of, of Acts chapter 8, it said, Now Saul was consenting to his death, um, and that was Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which, which was at Jerusalem. And then they got, all got scattered. Okay, now this, if there was persecution, and you fled, what would you do? Would you go into hiding to avoid the persecution? That seems reasonable. Okay, so what they did, it says here, um, as for, okay, in, in verse 4, therefore th those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> what a response to persecution. They decided they're going to go and preach the word, and that's what they did. So, so persecution, this first example given us in the quarterly. The next one is Acts, these two I pulled out for myself, Acts chapter 16. 
and it's uh, verses 22 to 25, Acts chapter 2. We know the story well. This is Paul and Silas. They got, um, they were beaten um, with rods and their backs were bleeding. They were put in prison. They got to prison, verse 25. Paul and Silas began praying and singing hymns to God. Amen. That's amazing, right? So they, met, they, they said, this is not kind of like sticks and stones may break my bones. They said, this is not going to stop us from preaching the gospel. They went ahead and preached the gospel. And the result was baptisms. The jailer and his family were baptized. The last one is my favorite. I love the Apostle Paul. I think many of you know that. Acts chapter 20. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24. He says, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry with which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul had heard about what was going to happen to him. It didn't deter him. He went in there. He didn't care. All he wanted to do was to serve God. My prayer for all of us is that as we face any kind of persecution, that we have that courage to know that we are doing what God has called us to do. It doesn't matter what you do to me. I'm going to serve God, and then he will, will protect us. The thing that Satan wants to, to, to do to us, he wants to give us overconfidence, and he wants to, to deceive us. Um, as I thought about this, I think one of the things that bothers us is temporal prosperity, uh, worldly honor, and a sense that we can decide what truth is. That is destroying the church. If we think that we can go to the Bible, reinterpret it, and decide which parts we want to believe or not, that will destroy the church. And that's the greatest thing that we have to fear. We have to recognize that this is the word of God, period. And we will obey and honor the word of God. We can't alter it. God sees everything, and we have to appreciate that this is his word. As we reject truth, we'll end up in trouble. So anyway, all right, any, other, any comments about that at all? Yes. How can the Satan be like in presenting God in a bad light? Yes. He wants us to believe that God is the villain. Yes. And he is the good person. And that is one of the main tools. He used that with the angel and succeeded. And he used it with Adam and Eve by telling Eve that God is keeping a big secret from you. It's torture. And he doesn't want you to know the other side. Yes. Effectively. Yes. Yes. In the church. Yes. And, and I want to make one of the statements. I mean, read something she said about this, but um, you know, we sometimes we think that the Bible was written by some old guys in a long, long time ago. They had no idea anything about the 21st century. It's a big surprise. What's happening today is like a surprise to God. No, it's not. He saw this down the road coming. Everything. Nothing surprises God. She says this: the religion which is current in our day is not, the pure, not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise, compromise with sin, because the great truths of God's word are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Something to think about. There is good news in all of this, and that is what are we to do today? Um, I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 24. So Matthew chapter 24. And I want to go back to where Jesus was. As Jesus, like I told you, in the first two verses of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, let me just read this. Then Jesus went out 
and departed, and this verse 24 is now happening on Tuesday. The triumphal entry was on Sunday. Matthew chapter 24, verse 1 and 2 was on Tuesday of Passion Week. He would be crucified on Friday. This is Tuesday. If he was going to be crucified on Tuesday and on Friday, and on Tuesday he's talking to you, would you pay rapt attention? You would, right? You'd want to know, what is he about to tell me? He is going to the cross and he knows that, but he takes the time to tell me something. What is he trying to tell me? All right. So it says, he's sitting out. That means we have five or 10 minutes left. He went out, for, departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him and, and, to show him the buildings. And Jesus said to them, do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be overthrown. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, and remember he's looking at that sheep gate. As he's looking, as he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said to him, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered him, them and told them all about the things that were going to happen. That there was going to be persecutions, tribulations, all kinds of scary things that we as Adventists like to read and scare me half to death. He tells of awful things, famines, wars, pestilences, all kinds of stuff. And he tells them this is, the time is not yet. Then he comes down here in verse um, 12. He says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Because it says lawlessness is a, a, will abound, the love of many will grow cold. The title of the lesson is the central issue, love or selfishness. In that context, the word but frames verse 13 to verse 14. So it says lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. He says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And it is then he says, and this gospel, not just any gospel, by the way, this gospel must relate to the love of Jesus Christ that we read before. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. I believe that as he's, Jesus is sitting there on the top of the hill, the Mount of Olives, looking down over, the, across the Kidron Valley, looking at the temple, looking at Jerusalem, he has a message for his people. The message is, in this time, loose your tongues. Go out and do something for the world. This gospel has to be preached. At this time, when all is going chaotic in the world, we as Christians have a job to do. And that job is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do in this time. It's not to go and hide. This gospel, and that go this gospel is not something you just say. It's something you also live. People are converted by how you live your life, not just by the talk you talk. I like, I want to end with this that Mark Finley has. Um, it's a story he told on Thursday's lesson. I'm just going to read this very quickly. Again, Jesus Christ has given us instructions. We are to be filled with the love of God and show that and live that before him and to other people in the world. They need to see Jesus Christ. So Mark says this. One of the greatest re revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics, we know all about that, plagued the early centuries around AD 160 and AD 260. Christians stepped forward and ministered to the sick and the dying. These plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the population. Over time, thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands and then millions in the Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during these two epidemics. Love, outgoing concern, and organized selfless care of the sick and the dying created an admiration of these believers for Jesus Christ. So we are called in the midst of all of this to live a life worthy of Jesus Christ, 
demonstrating his love to the onlooking world and to every single person beside us. This is the time for us to go out and do personal evangelism. And that's, that's tough for many of us to go out and do personal evangelism um, and to be engaged in serving others. So that bell was serious this time. <laughs> so let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we can't appreciate the depth of the love that you have for us. We are moved at the agony of Jesus Christ as he looked down through the ages and saw us and had pity for us and gave himself for us. Now you ask us to go out and to do likewise, to preach the gospel and to live the gospel that the whole world may eventually hear. Father, we pray to be faithful. Keep us from fear. And may we be a blessing to every single person we encounter. For Jesus' sake, amen.